in a row. All right, let's get back out to the Progressive Insurance Hotline right now and talk some boxing like we love to do on this show with the great Mike Montero from Montero on Boxing. What's up, Mike? Hey, what's up, Dave? Uh, actually, I am back in Los Angeles. As you know, I moved away a year ago, and I got back out here a couple days ago, gearing up for fight week for Errol Spence versus Sean Porter next week. I'm actually, as I'm talking to you, I'm looking out along the beautiful skyline of downtown Los Angeles from my hotel room. It's great to be back here, but i got to say, man, it feels even more crowded than it was when I left a year ago. I guess <laughs> more people, they cram more people in here, man. Well, are you staying downtown in fight headquarters there where all the media is staying? Yes, sir, absolutely. We're right oh. in the heart of everything. Yeah, and you know what? I'm, I'm doing a couple of shows on Radio Row next week representing SB Nation Radio, so you've got to come by down there and do a segment. Hey, that sounds great, man. Let's do if, it. If your wife allows you, because, you know, you were, you were awarded a man card violation a couple of weeks ago on my show, so uh, <laughs> if she allows you, maybe you can come down and do a segment. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, she has the man card in her purse, <laughs> and she'll let me hold it, and we'll Uber over to the studio, and we'll do the show. How about that? <laughs> well, Spence and Porter, um, uh, interesting fight. Uh, you know, as we know, uh, you know, Sean has a good chin, and he's an action fighter, and he's always coming forward. And, uh, you know, the, the only losses he has had have been very, very competitive fights, and you can make a case that he won those, the ones, the ones that went against him. But, but here, boy, he, th- th- this is a tough one because uh, – Coming in and taking a couple to give one is bad strategy against a skilled fighter like an Errol Spence. So could you see uh, Sean maybe getting stopped in this fight late? Well, you know, Dave, you mentioned Sean being so tough. He's never been stopped. He's never really been hurt, badly hurt anyway. So if Errol Spence made a statement like that and stopped Sean Porter, that would be huge. That would really, really be a massive statement. You know, for my money, I actually think Sean Porter is going to pose the biggest challenge Errol Spence so far in his career. He fought Mikey Garcia earlier this year in Dallas. I was ringside for that one. And although Mikey Garcia is a more accomplished fighter, a more skillful fighter than than Sean Porter pound for pound, he was moving up in weight. Sean Porter is a full-fledged welterweight, a very strong welterweight. When I talk to fighters that have, have faced him or sparred with him, they actually describe him as a bowling ball. He just rolls through you. So I think that it's going to be a rough and rugged fight, and I, I do like Spence, obviously, but I, I see it going the distance, and I think Porter's going to have moments. How about Canelo Alvarez stepping up two weight classes now to challenge a crusher, Sergey Kovalev, for the light heavyweight championship coming up? And, you know, Kovalev a little bit on the downside, and he's, got, he's been knocked out by Andre Ward, and, uh, and he's been knocked out twice in the last couple of years. Uh, uh, doesn't seem to like it to the body too much, which Canelo uh, specializes in. And even though he's moving up two weight classes, uh, I like Canelo in this fight. Yeah, you know, the early odds makers have Canelo up big. I actually think as, as the fight gets closer, the odds are going to even up. I think some of that, that Russian money is going to come into Vegas and kind of even up the odds. It'll be close, but of course, Canelo's going to be favored. You know, we just talked about when Errol Spence fought Mikey Garcia. Mikey Garcia was moving up two weight classes, but he was fighting a big, strong welterweight in Errol Spence in his physical athletic prime who hits very, very hard and is undefeated, never been stopped. Now you got Canelo moving up in weight, two weight classes. It looks like the same thing, but he's going up against a guy who's in his late 30s. You mentioned he's been stopped a couple times, doesn't take it to the body well. Canelo is a big body puncher. So it's not quite the same thing we saw earlier this year. I think this fight's going to be much more competitive. All that being said, when you look at Canelo Alvarez, since he's moved up to middleweight, and he's had, I think, one fight, or no, two fights, actually, at super middleweight, he hasn't knocked out an elite-level fighter above junior middleweight. He, he, he knocked out one guy, Rocky Fielding, who is not really a top-ten fighter. So he hasn't hurt or dropped anybody north of 160 pounds. This is at 175. Size matters. I'm starting to think, Dave, I'd call me crazy, but I'm starting to think this fight goes the distance, man. I really, really do. And if it does go the distance, that's bad news for, uh, for Kovalev, the way Oscar has those judges in his hip pocket in Las Vegas. Uh, you know, Canelo with the two fights over Triple G. Uh, you know, as the old saying goes, uh, Crusher's going to need a knockout to get a draw with, with this fight in Las Vegas. Yes, yeah, exactly. Uh, I hate to be that guy, but I'm going to go ahead and be that guy. He needs nine rounds to, to win a decision. And I, I really don't think it has much to do with Oscar De La Hoya. I think it has to do with the fact that Canelo Alvarez is the financial draw in boxing right now. And the establishment commission is Nevada. This is going to be in Las Vegas. We've already seen Canelo get 
favorable scorecards, and I'm you know I'm doing air quotes as I say the word favorable. Uh, so you know, actually, Gennady Golovkin is having a, a small little lunch uh, with with some selected media members Monday, and I'm going to be there, and I'm going to ask Gennady about this fight and what he thinks about the judges and. Can Kovalev get a decision? I'll be very curious to hear Gennady Golovkin's thoughts on this because, as you mentioned, a lot of people feel he got ripped off twice against Canelo and Daniel. And I'm one of them. Dave Smith here at SB Nation Radio and SBNationRadio.com on the Progressive Insurance Hotline with the great Mike Montero. Montero on boxing on his YouTube channel. Quote, buy, and save on home insurance with Progressive's new home quote explorer only at Progressive.com. Um, how about Oscar? You know, uh, evidently Ryan Garcia, one of his young stars, not happy with him, but evidently uh, they buried the hatchet and Oscar gave him a big long term contract. Canelo Alvarez, uh, we heard he wasn't speaking with Oscar uh, for a while, and, and then Oscar disappeared, and we we're wondering where he went. So, what's going on with Golden Boy? It's, it's hard to know, Dave. I, there seems to be two factions at Golden Boy. One, one is Oscar, and he's very inconsistent with some of his communication. He's hot and he's cold. He's absent sometimes. It doesn't even show up for some of his fighter spikes. He's not even there. And then there's the brass at Golden Boy, the people that actually make the decisions, guys like Eric Gomez and some of the other folks, who kind of have a different message going than Oscar does sometimes. So there's really a, a communication problem and a PR problem at Golden Boy Promotions. And it seems like Canelo Alvarez is almost running the show sometimes. I mean, Canelo and Kovalev had a press conference here in downtown Los Angeles a couple days ago. And Oscar De La Hoya said during that presser that should Canelo win, or win, lose, or draw, actually, that he's going to do a third fight with Golovkin next May around Cinco de Mayo. And Canelo said, no, nah, actually, we're not. Oscar says all kinds of crazy stuff. We're not doing that. I'm never fighting Golovkin again. So there's definitely trouble in paradise there. And you mentioned uh, Ryan Garcia. You know, they were going back and forth on Twitter for, for weeks, really months. Yeah. They were going back and forth on Twitter. Not just Oscar and Ryan, but Eric Gomez, the president there at Golden Boy and Ryan. But funny how everything's okay now that there was a lucrative contract extension. You know, everything's funny when you're making money. So as long as the money's flowing, everybody's happy. You know, everybody thought Tyson Fury uh, last weekend against uh, Otto Wallen was going to be a one-sided affair. And, uh, you know, one, one, just like the Schwartz fight, maybe one or two rounds. But turned into a competitive fight, and Fury was cut and fighting for his life over 12 rounds. And uh, Fury exposed a little bit, uh, Mike Montero, or, or was Wallen better than people thought? Uh, maybe it was a little bit of both, and I, I guess it depends on who you talk to. You know, uh, for my money right now, Dave, I mean, the ESPN commentary career, I got to say, I love Joe Tessitore. He's a good guy. I like Tim Bradley. Good guy. He was a great fighter. Max Kellerman's a good guy. But the, their commentary and their constant pushing – of Tyson Fury as the champion, the lineal champion, while glancing over the fact that he didn't fight for almost three years. There was performance enhancing drugs. There was cocaine. He yeah. retired, technically. He was stripped of every title, including us at the Ring Magazine. We stripped him uh, of our title. So, um, look, for my money, he's one of the top heavyweights in the world, and I wouldn't even argue with you if you wanted to rate him number one right now, number one or number two, but there's no champion. And all of these guys are flawed. And they all have more questions than answers right now. They have to fight each other. And in this fight, for me, Fury Stock did not rise or drop. He's kind of where I saw him the whole time. He's a very flawed guy. A amazing skill set for such a big man. He moves very well. Doesn't really have the one-hitter quitter, as we call it, you know, the power punch. But he can move very well, and he can outbox people if he can last 12 rounds without getting hurt. But he got cut early against Valine. I think it was the third round. And a big cut like that could change everything. And Valin, he tried to do what he could, uh, but, you know, he's just not a top 10 heavyweight. He's probably in the top 20, maybe. But he, a top 10 heavyweight with a cut that big in the third round probably can, can take advantage of that and get the fight stopped. Otto Valin just sort of that level. So Fury escapes there. And the, the cut man, Javier Capetillo, he really is, is uh, the man of the hour because he not only saved Tyson Fury tens of millions of dollars, but Deontay Wilder, Bob Arum, ESPN, PBC, Al Heyman. When they do that rematch between Wilder and Fury, man, that was almost off the table there for a second. So uh, the cut man did an awesome job there. 
Well, you mentioned uh, Joe Tessitore uh, do, doing the broadcast uh, that night. Uh, th- something happened that I've never seen before. There was a question on whether Fury's cut was with a butt or with a punch, and then when the word came in that it was with a punch, uh, Tessitore right. screaming and trying, and, and he's alerting Fury's corner and telling them exactly what the strategy was and telling him it was with a punch. That's not the announcer's job to make a, uh, to, 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 to go to go to somebody's corner and tell them what's going on with a ruling. Dave, I, I've never seen anything like that. I've seen the ref step out of line and kind of tell a fighter what's going on when it wasn't their place to, but I've never seen a commentary crew. I mean, I, I can't think of HBO, Showtime, anywhere I've ever watched fights where something like that happened, where he, Joe Tessitore literally told Bernardo Asuna, who does an outstanding job, I'm a big fan of Bernardo, Bernardo Asuna, but he told him, go to the corner, basically, go to the corner and let them know that this was from a punch. Because if you looked at Tyson Fury's body language in the fourth round, the fifth round, he was still pretty loose and relaxed. But once they were told, hey, man, this was, this was not from a headbutt. This is from a punch. If this fight gets stopped, you lose by TKO. That's the rules. All of a sudden, Fury comes out guns blazing. The last six, seven rounds of that fight, he was trying to knock Valine out. So, in other words, the commentary crew at ESPN made themselves part of the fight It made themselves part of Tyson Fury's team. That's gross incompetence, and that's unethical. That should never happen, and nobody in the media, except me, called them out on it. It's crazy. Well, uh, uh, last question here, Mike. You know, um, Vasil Lomachenko, uh, you know, a lot of people think he's the best fighter in the world, pound for pound, number one on most lists. Um, you got Tifima Lopez, I believe, going up against Richard Comey uh, in a lightweight title fight with the winner getting Loma. And then you have Devin Haney, who looks really good. Uh, let's say Lopez wins and, and Haney, either one of these guys uh, you think can, can beat Lomachenko, or are they too green and too inexperienced right now? I think at this moment they're just too green. I mean, Devin Haney looks spectacular in his last fight. He looked outstanding. To me, he's just a blue-chip prospect all the way. If he was a stock, I would move all my funds into Devin Haney. However, he hasn't fought anyone in the top ten yet. And to take a leap from the guy he just fought, who is a quality top 20 or so fighter, to Vasily Lomachenko, who is arguably number one pound for pound, as you mentioned. It's between him and Terrence Crawford. That's a huge leap. That's like going from high school football to the NFL. You just don't do that. So he needs to play some college football, if you hear me. And I think uh, Teofimo Lopez, you mentioned he's going to fight Richard Comey next. That's his college football. That's his freshman year at college. So if he looks good there and passes that test, he'll be as ready as he's ever going to be for Lomachenko. I still think Loma's going to win. But these young guys coming up, you know, in the next two or three years, yeah, one of these guys are probably going to take Loma out because, remember, he had a really long amateur career. He went to the pros pretty late. So the twilight of his career is coming up. Hey, Mike, tell, yeah, writing for Ring Magazine, of course, Mike Montero. Tell us about the YouTube channel, how we can watch your great show. So uh, my show is every Monday and Thursday, 7 p.m. Eastern time, and it's the Neutral Corner Boxing Podcast that's on YouTube at my channel, youtube.com slash Montero on boxing. But you can also find the audio version on iTunes, Spreaker, SoundCloud, uh, iHeartRadio, Spotify, everywhere. So just look for the neutral corner and you'll find it. Well, hopefully we'll see you down on Radio Row next week when I'm there representing SB Nation Radio and uh, in there with all the other broadcasters. And uh, we'll see you at the fight as well. And uh, Mike, uh, hopefully Tiffany will let you out and give, 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 give us a chance to see us. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell her that you requested we go, and I think because you requested, Dave, I think she'll let me go. There he is, the great Mike Montero with Dave Smith here at SB Nation Radio and SBNationRadio.com.